by doing it on a permanent deal on their terms, I'm sure that the McTominay deal will have aided this deal for uh, the permanent move for Uate. With regard to McTominay, it should be made clear here that Manchester United are reluctant sellers here. They didn't want to see Scott McTominay go, but there are a few factors that came into play here. Hello and welcome to Stretford Paddock. This is a one-on-one -on -one interview and joining me again is Damesh Sheth from Sky Sports News. Big day today, Damesh. Big deals being done at Manchester United. Loads to talk about, loads of transfers to get into. But first of all, how are you doing? I'm very well. Yeah, you're right. I know United are getting their business done. And as it stands, I mean, they don't look like they're going to be in for a deadline day panic but look, i'm not going to believe it until the, the deadline is over having yeah. seen what they've done in the previous windows yeah we, we we can't risk it we just we can't believe it just mm. yet but let's just get straight into you Garte. there's loads to talk about though Jaden sancho and i need to give you a bit of credit uh for you know what's going on there and your reporting of that uh, in particular but of course scott mctominay as well there are other ins and outs reported by manchester united or for manchester united but first of all manuel Ugarte. Just give me the sort of the, the line as it stands right now on that deal. It looks as though that deal has been agreed and is pretty much sorted. Is that right? Yeah, it, it is agreed now between Manchester United and Paris Saint-Germain. It is a deal worth 60 million euros, but it breaks up into a 50 million euro initial payment plus 10 million euros in performance related add-ons. And look, this has been Manchester United's primary midfield target throughout the transfer window. And initially... PSG went into negotiations wanting 60 million euros fixed plus the performance related add-ons because that's how much they paid Sporting Lisbon last summer. But United knew a couple of things that they were buying Joao Neves so they knew that PSG would have to do business and also they knew that uh, Manuel Uarte was desperate to come mm -hmm. to Manchester United. So instead of jumping into that deal and giving PSG what they wanted, they stayed patient on this one. Yes, in an ideal scenario, they would have got it done and dusted before the season started, but they wanted to make sure that they got the price that they believed was the right market price for Uate. So what they have done is they've managed to compromise on that price. So whereas before it would have been a 60 million euro fixed, it is a maximum now of 60 million euros. Mm. That's if he meets all of the performance related add-ons and you know what if Manchester United end up paying 60 million euros for Manuel Uate then I think PSG will be pleased and I think Manchester United will probably be pretty pleased as well because he will have fulfilled all of the conditions that are in his contract so the situation now is he's expected to fly into the to England today for a medical finalize those personal terms which effectively have been agreed in principle for weeks and weeks and weeks and as long as he's registered by midday on Friday, he'll be available for the small matter of Liverpool on uh, Sunday at Old Trafford. <sighs> big, it's a big small matter, that, isn't it? I mean, this deal generally, I want to get back into the fee in a minute and just sort of how United have operated in the summer, but just a little bit more on this. You said this was United's primary target and we've had to wait a little bit. It feels like... As United fans, especially after some sort of notable deals, I think the Anthony and Casemiro ones that came after those first two losses of the season a couple of years ago and have both been, you know, Casemiro is far more successful than, than the Anthony deal, but maybe overpays on both, certainly on Anthony. I think we've almost become mm. obsessed with this idea that if you sign them earlier in the window, then they're just a better player and it's a better transfer no matter what. Do you think, though, however, in this instance, holding on a little bit longer has meant that this deal has come at a better price and actually can still represent a good deal, even though it's happened after the season started? 100%. I would. Agree. This feels a lot different to those deals that they did with Casemiro and Anthony because simply because we've been talking about Manuel Uarte from minute one of this transfer window that this news of this interest came out in June and they've been chasing um, mm. Manuel Uarte all of that time have United, but they've just stepped back because they've allowed PSG to bring in the player that they wanted in Neves from Benfica and knowing then that suddenly the, the advantage kind of fell into United's court then simply because PSG had done their business before they'd sold Uarte. Mm. If PSG had gone into the market and tried to do a deal for Ugarte before they brought in Neves, we might be talking about this differently and they might have got the price that they originally wanted. But United, I, I think they've played, the, uh, they, they played this one really well, actually. Even though he's arriving after the season starts, 
I think this is a the signing that they've been wanting from the start of the window. A Casemiro mm. really wasn't mentioned in that transfer window until, you know, coming up to deadline day. Whereas this one, we knew that United wanted to bring him in. He's 23 years of age, so he fits the profile of player that United want. Let's see if, he, if he's a successful signing, but they've definitely been chasing him this whole time. Yeah, and I think as well the big difference in those deals and this one is that we ended up splashing extra cash on those deals because we were so late. This one's the opposite. We've sort of managed to yeah. save a, a few quid because we've been willing to wait. I think there's a difference there. One is panic and one is we're going to let this run out a little bit because we think that will represent the best deal. And it seems as though, I mean, maybe we could have got another couple of million off, but we got less mm -hmm. or we've paid less for him than PSG wanted. And also, I know that it seems like a lot of deals are reported in euros. I don't know if that's because they're paid in euros or because it's a European team that we're dealing with. But I think 42 mm -hmm. million pounds even though it or 42.8 million pounds sounds a lot less money than 50 million euros does even though it's the same yeah. fee i think yeah. you look at 42 million quid yeah. you don't get a lot for that these days and a 23 year old who's got his, his sort of defensive acumen his numbers in terms of tackles and interceptions are absolutely astronomical one of the best in europe do you think united think at least that they've got the sort of the right guy to take united forward do you, do you imagine him to be an immediate starter for manchester united you would think so. Uh, whether he starts against Liverpool, um, you know, depends how he does in training, how many training sessions he has, because he hasn't played at all for PSG, has he? So he's not been involved in their squad. So I, I'd be surprised if he started against Liverpool if he was thrown straight in. Maybe if he can train with United and and you know maybe even be on the bench, or whether it'll be one of those days where rather like Raphael Varane when he arrived, it'll be a presentation mm. in front of Old Trafford, maybe. I don't know. So that was, that's going to be totally up to the manager, of course. He'll make that decision on whether um, Uarte is in a position to start that game or not. But I think United feel that they've got a good deal here, simply because that they feel that they've been patient with it. Um, they could have gone in and, yeah, let's just spend the money that PSG want earlier on in the window. But they knew... The situation there and they had other targets in other positions that they they were probably more pressing not mm -hmm. regards to the position that needed filling but the actual situation of a particular deal for example euro they knew that real madrid liverpool they were hanging around and not going away so maybe the focus was right we can park ugarte at the moment because we know we've got the advantage here we know he wants to come so Part of that deal is effectively done whereas the euro one they had to do a lot of work on and mm -hmm. so bringing him in before uate it makes sense and now united are on the verge of signing um uate it feels like that they have got that deal in, in the way that they wanted to do it and on their terms yeah i think if you just look at the dates that we signed them you could compare ugarte and casemiro or anthony mm -hmm. but i think this is the difference between patience and panic isn't it that's yes. that seems to me the difference it doesn't um, feel it doesn't feel panicked this no. window from united yeah oh it's such a breath of fresh air that in it um on to mm -hmm. other midfield uh sort of signings or sales in this case scott mctominay um seems like a 30 million euro deal has been agreed for him to move to napoli uh, again i think that's a fee that is seems pretty fair for all involved uh what's the latest on that is that expected uh, to be to be dealt with quickly and, and was that fee and the fact that, that we've managed to get that 30 million euros directly linked to ugarte being a full transfer rather than this loan with obligation to buy that we've heard rumored in the last couple of weeks i mean the information that i got on this was that it would help aid a, a permanent deal for manuel uarte but I, I'm not saying categorically that if they couldn't sell McTominay, they could only do a loan with an obligation, but that might have been the avenue that United would have pursued. And I think PSG would have still had to have gone along with it because they knew they needed to do this deal. So it, it, what might have ended up happening is if it turned into a loan plus an obligation, then would United have had to have paid a little bit more because they are then really doing it on terms that PSG wouldn't have wanted. So by doing it on a permanent deal on their terms, I'm sure that the McTominay deal will have aided this deal for uh, the permanent move for Uate. With regard to McTominay, it should be made clear here that Manchester United are reluctant sellers here. They didn't want to see Scott McTominay go, but there are a few factors that came into play here. He wanted regular first-team football. And I don't think Manchester United 
could have guaranteed McTominay regular first team football. Yes, they could have guaranteed him a place in a match day squad nearly every single week because he's got that knack of being able to come on and score goals. Now, while United would have been satisfied with that kind of role, you've got to think about the player as well. Would McTominay have been satisfied with that kind of role? And if it had continued in that vein, he's only got a year left on his contract with a year option. United would then be in a position of, we need to renew his contract. But McTominay would probably have been averse to have, done, to have renewed a contract with his current playing time. So I think everything came together with the timing to suggest this is probably going to be a move that's going to sue everyone. Napoli will get a player. Manchester United will get pure profit, remember, because this is someone who's grown up at Manchester United. So he will represent pure profit in the books. However callous that sounds, it is a, um, an, a factor that Manchester United and every single club has to take into account when they're, when they're looking at signings uh, of players and selling players, because it will be 30 million euros that will go straight into the books as pure profit. And also given the relationship United have with McTominay, he wants first team football. And if they're going to be very honest with each other and say, you're probably not going to get that here, mm. then let's look for a deal. That's how this has transpired. So over the weekend, 30 million euros were sorted. We think personal terms, as good as agreed in principle, the only issue that was delaying this deal, rather like Aaron Wambasaka when he went from uh, Manchester United to West Ham United, were the exit terms. Uh, for Scott McTominay because McTominay hasn't actually asked to leave. Manchester right. United are sanctioning this deal. So he's due some money for the remainder of the one year that he's got left on his contract. I'm not sure the ins and outs of it, whether the option year would come into play there, but this seems to have been more straightforward to sort out than it had been for wan because that seemed to get delayed and delayed and delayed. But this one looks like it's really, really close. And there's an expectation almost that he might even fly to Italy today mm. to, wow. to take his medical and then finalise those personal terms. So I think when you look at it, it's probably a deal that's worked for everyone. Yeah. Is it, McTominay is a, a strange one for me because I think it's very similar to wan -Bissaka. Like I think it was right for him to move and I think with the style of play we're looking to play that he doesn't quite fit in in the way that you know other players do but he was also starting every week him and wan -Bissaka, under Solskjaer and when it was really fun to watch United again that you know it felt like we had all these sort of miserable years or this miserable spell under uh, Mourinho at least where everyone was falling out with each other it was horrible and then Solskjaer came in and there was this wave of optimism a club legend managing us getting to load of semi-finals finishing second mm. in the league and McTominay was a big part of that so it's a little bit sad to see him go but I think it's it's the right thing uh, for Manchester United uh, a player who maybe you know we haven't seen such exciting times out of um, uh, is Jaden Sancho and I want to say before we ask I asked you what's going on there last week you came on here and said I asked you any other deals anything else that you might think might be going on and you said keep your eye on Jaden Sancho because you're hearing that there's a few clubs still sort of sniffing around for Sancho mm. and in the meantime there's been a sort of explosion of news that Juventus are after him, X, Y, and Z club are after him. It seems as though Juventus have got the strongest link. But firstly, thank you for kind of guiding us towards something going on with Jadon Sancho. And secondly, um, what do you think is the latest with, with Jadon Sancho? Do you think this is a deal that now feels like we could get him out of the club before the end of the window? It's a distinct possibility. Whether it will happen or not will depend on Manchester United and Jadon Sancho. Where we stand at the moment is Juventus definitely want to sign him but they've made it clear to United that their proposal is going to be a loan. Could they be stretched to doing a loan with an option? Potentially. As far as we're aware, it won't go into an obligation or a permanent deal as far as Juventus are concerned, simply because of their finances. They're already signing two wingers, Juventus. Mm. And Nicolas Gonzalez is coming from uh, Fiorentina and um, Conte Sao as well from Porto. So there are two players who are already arriving at Juventus. I think Gonzalez has already been agreed and I think he, Conte Sao was already there for his medical. That might have been, even been announced while we've been talking. So, so you would think, why do they need Sancho? Well, such is the dearth of quality players that they've got in that position. That was their primary focus for this transfer window. Mm. And so Jadon Sancho does remain a very, very strong option for Juventus. However, as I mentioned before, they've made it clear it's a loan that they want to do. From United's perspective, there is also a potential permanent deal that could be in the offing as well, because Chelsea 
are exploring mm. the conditions of a deal. Now, we think that they're exploring a loan, they're exploring a loan with an obligation, they're exploring a permanent deal. And with all of these deals, it seems that there could be players that they could offer that will go the other way from Chelsea to Manchester United. And the ones that have been mooted are Ben Chilwell, when we talk about the left back area being a problem area for Manchester United. So people put two and two together, but I'm told that that is one of the players that could be offered by Chelsea. And that's because they've made it clear that he's not part of their plans anymore. And Raheem Sterling, who's been taken out of the first team reckoning as well. And that would be like, you know, a forward player leaving Manchester United and a forward player coming in to Manchester United. So that's where we stand with, Juventus and Chelsea's interest in Sancho. Mm. What needs to happen now is what Manchester United want to do and what Jadon Sancho wants to do. So with regard to United, we understand that their preference would be to do a permanent deal for Jadon Sancho or at the very least a loan with an obligation. However, his contract situation is a very, very significant um, factor in what could happen in the final three days. That's because this is not a player like McTominay, who's got one year left plus one year option. Sancho has effectively got three years left on his contract because he's got two years left of his regular contract and United have the option of extending that for a further year. So at the moment, we've gone through this transfer window where at the start of it, Sancho, we thought would be available for sale and that United's valuation was around 40 million pounds. Mm. This was at a time when there was no sign of reconciliation between Sancho and Eric Ten Hag. But there was no sign of any club, even though there was interest from the likes of Juventus and Borussia Dortmund, of any club meeting that valuation. Then what transpired is United, Eric Ten Hag and Jadon Sancho drew a line under all of their issues. Everyone's kissed and made up. He's part of the first team squad. He's reintegrated. He's gone on the tour. He's going to be part of the first team reckoning. So everyone thought, right, he's back in. They're not going to accept a deal. They're, 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 they're going to give Sancho a chance. Then the season starts. Ear infection rules him out of the first game. OK, you take that on face value, fine. He's not in the squad. It was the second game that you've got to mm -hmm. look at. He actually travelled to Brighton. And then he wasn't involved in that first team squad, in the match day squad. So then you're thinking alarm bells are ringing. What, what is going on with United here? So while United would prefer the permanent or the loan with the obligation, I don't think you can rule out the loan offer from Juventus. And two reasons. One, the Chelsea one might be more attractive with regard to finances and maybe getting a player, but it's going to depend on whether Manchester United want one of these players. Mm. It's going to be a big issue. And number two, because of his contract situation, if Jadon Sancho is not going to be playing regular first team football at United this season, which from the outset at the moment, it appears it's not looking good for him, if we were being completely honest, given how this season has started. Then if he stays at United and doesn't play, what is that going to do to, do to this so-called £40 million valuation come January, come next summer? It's not going to go up. That's a fact. However, if he was to go to Juventus on a straight loan, plays regular first team football there, plays well there, it's sort of a calculated risk that United would take. So he would then come back to United next summer, but he would still effectively have two years left on his contract and United could still demand a reasonable transfer fee. Mm. And who knows, his market valuation could be what they want around £40 million if he was to perform well at Juventus. If he, if he goes there and he doesn't, you could be back to square one. But, you know, there won't be any movement there in any way because yeah. you're, you're at square one right now. So is it a calculated risk that United think is worth taking? That's the big question. So that's why I think even though they want the permanent, the loan can't be ruled out here. Yeah, it feels like the loan's better than nothing, isn't it? Better than him sort of sitting on the bench at United. You might as well loan him out and see if he plays well. Like you said, yeah. then if he does, you might get that 40 million quid for him. In because terms second of Chelsea... half of last season, oh, Joe, sorry, sorry yeah. to interrupt. Second half of last season, I mean, he was getting lots of praise for his performances at Borussia Dortmund. Hence why when he came back, United felt they could get this 40 million pounds for him. Yeah. 
it since transpired that they couldn't get that money because no one was willing to pay it. But if he was to have a full season in Serie A and perform really well, yeah. who's to say Juventus then wouldn't almost use it as an option, alone with an option and say, look, he likes it here, we like him, let's try and do a deal. They would be in the driving seat, even though they wouldn't have an option to buy him. So yeah. I think... I think it would be a calculated risk that United would definitely have to consider with regard to Sancho. Yeah, it's interesting, and it? it's a it's a tough one. This United sort of it almost, uh, and I don't want to be too disparaging to him because you know it, it, I don't think he's a, a terrible player or a terrible person, but it feels like he's the sort of him him and his relationship with Ten Hag that can't be good for the dressing room. I don't think you know whether it's his fault or Ten Hag's fault or both. It just feels like these are two people who seemingly don't really get on. And I think when we're trying to build this sort of harmony and this momentum in the squad, it feels like it's just, you know, him going elsewhere to me, it makes the most sense. And hopefully we can get a deal done. The only problem is, J Chelsea, I don't, I don't know if they've got anyone that United would want. I don't, you know, it's like when you're, you're at school and you've got your lunchbox out and you want someone's wagon wheel and all you've got is some fig rolls to swap for them. Like, do we want Ben Chilwell, a, a, a left back who's been injured for a hundred games in the last three years? That, you know, we've already got a, injury prone left backs is there any sign that United are interested in any of these potential Chelsea options it seems to be coming from the Chelsea end and Chelsea okay. have made it clear that these two players are no longer part of their plan so they will I mean I've seen on social media when I when I posted something about Chelsea it's Cole Palmer or nothing no mm. deal but you see that's the kind of caliber of player Manchester United will want to bring in of course they would but having said that I'm not saying look I'm not getting this is not from any intel I'm getting from United whether they'd be interested or not it just seems that the left back area is an issue and if you lose a forward player then do they want to recruit someone in the forward mm. area and is it going to be easier rather than starting again with a new deal if they haven't made any progress with anyone just to get this a Chilwell or a Sterling in to make mm. up the squad and to have you'd still say quality players in the squad if there were injuries in those positions. So I don't know. I, I, I That's why I think that the, the one with Juventus is still something that can't be ruled out, even though it would only be a loan. Very interesting um, indeed. Um, just in terms of a bit more generally then, are there any other players that United seem to be looking to bring in? Because it seemed as though it was... Couple of mid, or a couple of centre backs, midfielder, striker, fullback. We've done that now, or you know, with hopefully when Ugarte gets mm. finished, uh, we'll have done that. Do you think there's still a chance, other than those potential Chelsea links, that United could look for a replacement for Sancho or a sort of backup left back late on in the window to replace yeah. that situation? You never say never, but mm. I mean, they had their priority positions, like the ones you've just mentioned: right back, centre back, midfield, forward, and once Uarte signs. They have filled all of their priority positions. It's just one of those areas where left back seems to be an area where they could do with another player in there, mm. only because of the injury situation that they've had. But then United could argue, well, we've actually brought in Nusir Mazraoui and he can play at right back and he can play at left back. And Diogo Dalo can play at right back and he can play at left back. And I mean, judging by, I, I couldn't believe it when I saw the cross come in for the Armand Diallo chance. Mm. I had to look again. I was like, I actually rewound. I was like, wow, that is an incredible cross from Darlow. So he's shown he can play on both both fullback areas as can Masraoui. So United could argue that and say, yes, it would be good to have more reinforcements in that area. But at the end of the day, we've got two players who can play both positions. And also Luke Shaw at the moment from all the information we've got is a short-term injury. It's not a, a player who is out for six months. Mm. And I say that, you know, I say that reluctantly because of what happened last season, but that's what United's thinking would be because are they going to bring in a player because they believe Luke Shaw isn't going to be fit for the majority of the season? No, they can only do it at the moment as it stands. He'll, he's out until after the international break. So yeah, what, what what do you do? Do you continually bring in players and then get this bloated squad again? There's that Sergio Reguilon link that won't go away. Tottenham still want to offload him. Manchester United do like him. They've liked him for a while. Is that a potential deal again that they could do rather like they did in the last transfer window when they got him on this season-long loan with that callback option? You know what? It's, 
it doesn't seem likely at the moment, but it could be something that United could look at into that position in the final few days. Mm. Interesting. Uh, and finally then, what about sales? Because there's a couple of names. That have been, it feels like a lot of the players United were linked with moving on. I know some of these aren't sales, but before the season ended, it was Martial, Varane, Sancho. Obviously, there's rumours there now. Wan-Bissaka, McTominay. Mm. The other couple that were linked early on were Maguire and Casemiro and Lindelof. It seems as though all those three are going to be staying now. I mean, Maguire and Casemiro, I would be almost certain they're going to stay. But is there any movement on Victor Lindelof or has his injury and a lack of interest maybe ruled that one out? Yeah, I mean, with Casemiro, I think we, United, uh, Sky Sports News did a graphic of like, I think Eric Ten Hag had said, you know, he needs two strong players in every single position. Yeah. And when the graphic came up, the only blank was under Casemiro. Yeah. So... I can't see a situation where they bring in Uarte and then sell Casemiro. They're going to do that whole midfield conundrum by allowing Scott McTominay to leave. And that's more financial thing as well. So Lindelof is looking increasingly likely that he'll see out his contract and, and assess all of his options in both January and next summer. Um, the other couple that we need to look at, I suppose, a is Lindelof. We talk, we've talked about Sancho. Is Hannibal Medjbury? That mm. one looks like it's moving to uh, Burnley. Yep. And he's only got a year left on his contract. So that would be a permanent deal that's under discussion at the moment. So United would look to sell um, Medjbury. I'm not sure how big the fee would be, given that Burnley will know that they want to sell. And given he's not a regular starter at United, not really a regular squad player at United either. And... Um, Burnley will see that they can do a good deal as far as they're concerned with regard to the transfer fee. I'm sure what Manchester United will do, as has been keeping, in keeping with what they've done during this transfer window, is as much as they've tried to bring in the players in their priority positions, they're trying to sell much better than they have done historically, mm. which has been a real, real issue for them. And in particular, when it comes to selling young players, if the transfer fee is not huge, they always try and attach a significant sell-on onto these players. So if they do get sold on eventually, the likelihood is because the transfer fee originally was so low, they'd probably go for a bit more money than they got sold for. And United can still be making money every single mm. season, every single transfer window. And every we've, we've seen with PSR rules that every single bit of money that a club can get in can count for something. Just looking at the, um, the departures... Um, and it's looking as though with McTominay, and I think there was a rumour of around eight to nine million pounds for Hannibal. Let's say, let's assume it's somewhere in that area. Uh, that'll take United's sales this summer to over a hundred million pounds or hundred million euros. And, Unheard of. And it, I think it's, it's happened once since 2010. Have we made a hundred million euros in sales? Um, and that was 2016. But part of that was be was because we sold Angel Di Maria for 63 million of those euros after one season in a failed transfer. These are all players that we're letting go this year who are have been here longer, who haven't all mm -hmm. been sort of immediate. Right, we've got to get him in, get him out. A um, hundred million euros is a lot of money. And you look at some of the players who we've sold for that that are sort of a attributed to that. I think, um, you know, Wan-Bissaka, Kambuala, uh, Hannibal as well, Facundo Pellistri, all adding in there as well, Mason Greenwood, uh, Scott McTominay. A lot of these players are people who weren't first team or first, you know, first name on the team sheet players. And yet we've managed to get around 100 million for them. I think that's very good. And like you said, yeah. as, as far as a focus is concerned, being better at selling, that is a huge difference in terms of PSR and the sustainability of the club going forward. Do you think that United have done a much better job of that this summer and that Ineos sort of, they'll be proud, not proud, but pleased with how they've sold? Yeah, and they had to because mm. they've come into a club and they've seen so many players on big long-term contracts on massive wages. And I think it's not only the transfer fees that they're getting and as much as they will feel, look, we lost money on Varane, lost money on Martial when they should have been getting transfer fees for, for these players, they will also know that the huge wages that these players were on, that's going to count for something as well because they are now off the books. Those wages are now off the books. So in that way, they, need, they knew they needed to do that. They mm. needed to sell better, but also to, to get some of these wages off the books because what was happening before, they probably looked at United from afar and thought, how 
is this sustainable? It's, it just can't keep happening because, I mean, I've said this over and over again to you on this podcast, Joe, when mm. uh, since the Glazers have come in and particularly since Sir Alex Ferguson left the club, the, the change around of managers has borne no resemblance. And hence, they've always wanted to back the manager that they brought in and given him £200 million every time to spend to end up with a mishmash of a squad that Ineos are now trying to repair and now changing the focus on incomings by bringing in five players whose the biggest age, I think, is it 26? If mm. I'm not mistaken, Masraoui is 26. Yeah. You might need to correct me on that. No, and that's then you've correct, got yeah. Delict at 25, Uate at 23, Zerkze at 23, Yoro is 18 years old. These are all players who haven't even reached their peak yet and who have got a high ceiling. And if the time comes when United think, right, we need to bring someone else in and sell a particular player, they're going to be in a position where they could still make profits on these players. Of course, they want to keep them. That That's clear because they wouldn't have brought them in otherwise. But, you know, sometimes that happens in football and you might want to sell a player. Though you're seeing this situation compared to like Sancho, hmm. 73 million pounds of six-year contract one-year option or whatever it was big big wages and now we're into the final three days of the window and they're trying to scratch around to get a loan done with juventus or maybe a, a weird kind of deal with chelsea yeah. these are the deals they don't want to have to do anymore hence why it looks like they're moving on these players that they don't want and i think one of the big things as well is as much as united fans might be disappointed when you see the likes of mctominay leave the club you made a great point there. They weren't necessarily first team players. They were squad players and United are making money on these squad players mm. and they're bringing in players who they hope will close the gap and also go straight into the first team. And if they don't go straight into the first team, the competition that's created by their arrival is going to be much, much better than it was before. So, that's the kind of approach United are taking. And it isn't rocket science because every other club seems to be doing it. But United fans are thinking, wow, this is really good <laughs> simply because it's such a low bar of what's yeah. happened in the previous 10 years. They're just playing catch up, really. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? I, I, I feel so sort of excited and giddy about this when, like you said, if me and you sat down for a couple of hours, we could probably come up with something like this. Like the fact that we've been yeah. so, you know, far behind and doing things so differently and erratically compared to all the other top teams in Europe. It is a little bit bizarre, but it seems as though hopefully United have uh, sort of walking in the right direction now. Um, thank you very much, Darmesh. That was a long one. That was great to chat to you uh, for all that time. Thank you for taking us through all of those deals. It's actually deals happening, which is the maddest thing. It's, like you said, it's the sales for me that is really, really exciting mm. because United have actually got a bit of leeway, a bit of movement and some turnover of squad members rather than letting people leave on a free after their full six years of their deal. So it feels very, very refreshing. Thanks very much, Darmesh, uh, for coming on. No problem. Pleasure. Right, that's going to be all from us. Thank you very much for joining us. This has been a one-on-one -on -one interview with Darmesh Sheth from Sky Sports News. Hit like on the video if you haven't already, and we'll see you in a bit.